Serious, what's the creepiest, most interesting solved mystery? Please do like, share, and subscribe. The HBO documentary Mommy Dead and Dearest. The mother of a sick and crippled little girl with cancer and various other bizarre medical conditions gets brutally murdered. It turns out the daughter wasn't sick or crippled at all. The mother was poisoning her with all these medications for illnesses she didn't have and making her pretend she couldn't walk, Munchausen by proxy. The daughter met a boy on the internet with autism, told him the truth, and convinced him to kill the mother. Debugging behind the Iron Curtain Computers at a Soviet train station would randomly bug out and no one knew why. One guy eventually traces it to when livestock was being brought in from Ukraine, where Chernobyl left the cows with so much radiation they could flip bits. The Mixed Day Family Disappearance and Murder I'm going to fuck it up if I fully explain, but the short version is a family of four is found missing. Nothing disturbed in their home. It looked like they just up and left. A search is performed, and their car is found near the Mexico border. Border surveillance is checked, and a family of four who resembles them, on grainy video, is found so everyone thinks they were running away from something or one. After a few years later, someone off-roading in the California desert stumbles upon their remains. After digging deeper into the family's relationships, they arrest the business partner of the slain father of the family, and, if I'm not mistaken, the trial is just starting or has been postponed to start very soon. The Body in Room 348 This is another one I've posted about, but it's such a good mystery, really. Doesn't read my summary. Go for the article. A man is found dead in his hotel room. He enjoys drinking and eating less than healthy and has been a lifelong smoker. It looks like natural causes from a lifestyle that caught up with him. He was found lying on the floor as if staggering for the door. The autopsy says otherwise. He's got a laceration in his scrotum, and it's bruised and swollen as if he'd had been given a hard kick. There's bruising in his groin that rises up through his hips and abdomen. Inside his organs are bruised and lacerated. It looks like he was brutally beaten. However, his hotel room was normal, except, you know, for his corpse. Nothing out of order, no blood, no signs of anything foul. Case goes cold. A new detective is brought in, one known for solving the unsolvable. He sits down with the medical examiner to go over autopsy photos and such. Then he figures it out. The man had been shot through his scrotum. That was the laceration and the wrinkled skin folded to obscure the bullet hole. The bullet had traveled up through his body, causing the other injuries. So who did it? There had been a group of men in the room next door and one of them pulls out a gun and starts playing with it. It went off, firing through the wall into the victim's room where it hit him. The men used toothpaste to fill the bullet hole, which had been through a part of the wall that wasn't easy to notice. Weird. There's a couple that come to mind for me. The 30-year-old cold case murder of Raina Mariquin that was solved when a New York family found a 55-gallon drum in the crawl space of their basement that had been sitting there for years through many previous homeowners. The original Spider-Man murder. Pretty freaky if you think about it. Makes you want to double check your attic and basement often just in case. This man snuck into a couple's house and lived in their attic for years in a tiny makeshift room with a false door. He would come out at night to eat. One evening, the wife woke up to her husband being stabbed to death in the kitchen. Police were perplexed because there was no sign of breaking and entering or any other evidence at that. She lived in the home alone with this guy secretly living in the attic for about a year, but left the house abandoned after much heartbreak. A couple of the original detectives on the case just couldn't get the case off their mind, so they would drive by the abandoned house every so often just to see if they could come up with some new ideas on solving the case. One night, on a random drive-by, they see a shadow of a man in the upstairs attic window and quickly bust in to see what was going on. By a mere seconds, one of the cops catches a glimpse of his foot going up in this tiny trap door. When they push it open, they find this man living in a tiny makeshift room with newspaper clippings of the murder. He would eventually come clean and confess to the murder. The thought of someone living in your attic or basement secretly without you knowing gives me the heebie-jeebies. Posted this elsewhere, but the weepy-voiced killer was a serial killer who would murder women and then call the police weeping, stating he regrets 
and saying he needed to be caught and couldn't help himself. Some of his calls are readily available on the internet and are pretty chilling. Anyway, he bit off more than he could chew one night with a prostitute named Denise Williams who sensed danger, hit him with a glass bottle, and with the help of another dude, managed to escape. Paul Michael Stefani was caught when he sought medical assistance and was identified by the dude who had clashed with him. He was convicted of a murder, an attempted murder, but later confessed to three murders and two attempted murders when he realized he would die of cancer. The Benjamin Kyle Mystery Benjamin Kyle was the alias chosen by an American man who has severe disassociative amnesia after he was found without clothing or identification and with injuries next to a dumpster behind a fast food restaurant in Georgia in 2004. As a result of his lack of personal memories between 2004 and 2015, neither he nor the authorities were sure of his real identity or background, despite searches that used widespread television show-based publicity and various other methods. It was recently solved in 2015. It took 11 years, but they found out his true identity. Two girls were on their way to a college party in 1971 in South Dakota and all of a sudden went missing virtually vanished with no leads. They tore up the property of a classmate who was in prison on rape charges but found no evidence of the girls. 42 years later, in 2013, a nearby creek dried up and revealed a car with the two girls' bodies inside. There was a segment on the TV show Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction where a big brother was taunting his younger brother about a monster in the closet or something like that. Then, one day, the big brother goes into the closet and disappears. The show insinuates there was something supernatural going on and viewers were freaking out when it was revealed to be one of the true stories. But it turns out the big brother had some secret passage that he escaped out of and he was basically just running away from home. In Pennsylvania, there was an urban legend of a thing called the Green Man or Charlie No-Face. For many years, people would say they had seen this weird human-like creature wandering through the streets at night. It had no face and had green skin. After sightings became more and more common, some people started investigating. That was when they discovered Raymond Ray Robinson, the man behind the urban legend. Due to an accident with a power line, he became severely deformed. Because the way he looked, people would cause panic whenever a place he would go. His only choice was to walk at night. He was so scary that more than one time, people tried to hit him with their cars, thinking they had found the famous monster Green Man. Search his name and you will understand why people were scared of him. Green Man. The Disappearance of the Stardust It's 1947 and aircraft manufacturers are in a race to profit from the post-war air travel market. Avro of England comes up with the Lancastrain, a passenger version of the famed Lancaster with the same four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. On a scheduled flight from Buenos Aires to Santiago, Chile, the Lancastrain stardust of British South American Airways takes off and begins its dead reckoning navigation. It will be many years before directional beacons, much less widespread airport radar or electronic positioning systems. The navigator must give the pilot a bearing and note the airspeed and time for the different legs of the flight then calculate the distance covered. The Lancastrain has ample power to cross the Andes, and the flight has been done without incident many times. At the appropriate time, the navigator tells the pilot to begin his descent into Santiago. The crew waits to drop below the cloud in confidence that the airport lights will be visible somewhere below. The plane sends a Morse code message to the airport, ending in the odd term S-T-E-N-D-E-C, and then simply vanishes. When search planes find no trace of the plane, crew, and six passengers, the disappearance is reluctantly consigned to the annals of unsolved mysteries. People jump on the story with multiple theories of what the strange message meant and speculate on sabotage, political intrigue, and even alien abduction. In reality, there are no explanations, and so it remained for 50 years. In 1998, two Argentine climbers have reached the foot of the glacier on Mount Tupagato, 50 miles east of Santiago. They spot a strange form, which turns out to be a battered aircraft engine. There are also pieces of twisted metal and ripped clothing. Stardust has been found. 
a subsequent military expedition discovers other engines, wheels, propellers, and human remains. By now, a phenomenon that was virtually unknown in 1947 is understood and well plotted on a daily basis, the jet stream. Aided by a study of the wreckage, it becomes apparent that the plane flew head-on into a known jet stream at the high altitude needed to cross the Andes. Its airspeed, as opposed to the ground speed, had remained normal, while it was in fact falling far below what was expected, and the plane was well short of its destination when the crew confidently began its descent. Stardust had apparently flown straight into the near-vertical head of the glacier, causing an avalanche that instantly hit it from searchers. Over the course of 50 years, the mangled wreckage crew and passengers became part of the glacier, slowly traveling to its foot to await discovery. As for the strange broadcast, many solutions have been forwarded, but S-T-E-N-D-E-C remains a mystery. The Case of the Vanishing Blonde After a woman living in a hotel in Florida was raped, viciously beaten, and left for dead near the Everglades in 2005, the police investigation quickly went cold, but when the victim sued the airport regency, the hotel's private detective, Ken Brennan, became obsessed with the case. How had the 21-year-old blonde disappeared from her room, unseen by security cameras? The author follows Brennan's trail as the PI worked a chilling hunch that would lead him to other states, other crimes, and a man nobody else expected. And then? Yu Young Jool Korean serial killer, home invader, who was released from police custody twice, once by walking out, and made it into the 2008 film Chaser, was eventually hunted down and captured by vigilante pimps of the girls he murdered. I saw this story on TV, probably on forensic files. It was a case of double murder, I believe, with the wife dead and the husband severely beaten. At some point hours later, the husband wakes up but he's all beaten and may have had massive head trauma. Anyway, his body is on autopilot, so he gets up and goes to get the paper off the lawn, brings it back inside, then dies. It's so disturbing to me. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee in the 1970s. Terrible crimes were rare. The disappearance of nine-year-old Marsha Trimble in 1975 gripped the city in fear and sadness for over a month until her body was found. She was delivering Girl Scout cookies a couple of doors down from her home and vanished. The case was strange from the beginning and went unsolved for 33 years. I called my older sister when I heard the news and we both just cried even though it had been so long. We had friends close to the case and my folks were friends with the police chief at the time. The entire city felt the same way. We all felt she was one of us and that's what made the whole thing so scary and sad. There were several suspects and many theories of the case, but none ever panned out. It turns out, a local man had murdered a Vanderbilt student and raped a Belmont student just days before killing Marsha Trimble. He was arrested in March for those crimes and was imprisoned. He eventually confessed to Marsha's murder to other inmates who turned him in. Their parents both died before a case was solved. This one's pretty widely known on Reddit, but Lori Erica Ruff. Short version is that she was a Texas mother and wife whose past was shrouded in mystery from her husband and in-laws, who suspected she was hiding something and felt that she was lying about her age. She appeared older than she was claiming to be. Her behavior became increasingly erratic, and her husband filed for divorce. She killed herself on Christmas Eve 2010, after which her in-laws went through her private belongings and found a birth certificate for a Becky Sue Turner and documents requesting a name change from Becky Sue Turner to Lori Kennedy her maiden name. It was discovered that Becky Turner had actually died in a fire at the age of two in the 70s. From what people were able to dig up, Lori had somehow obtained Becky's birth certificate and used it to petition a name change for herself to Lori Kennedy. Investigators were able to find only a few people who knew her before she married her husband. Her identity was finally discovered in 2016 thanks to forensic DNA evidence and social security records. She was Kimberly McLean, a Pennsylvania woman who had run away as a teenager. We still don't know what she was up to in the two years between when she left Pennsylvania and when the next sighting of her shows up in California two years later. I'm probably messing up the details of the story. It's an interesting one, though. 
This one stuck with me since I saw one of the identification discovery shows detailing the story. It's not as much of a mystery as some cases since it didn't make national or international news while being solved, but I'm damn sure it was a clusterfuck of a mystery for people that knew this couple and police investigating it. Police were called to a hotel because a man jumped to his death. He had a long suicide note in his pocket and it said something to the effect of, I'm ending my life because I'm so sorry for the one I took. Super paraphrased here. So, police went to his address and found crazy rantings spray painted on the wall, including, look in the oven. Oh, what did they find in the oven, you wonder? It's body parts belonging to his girlfriend. Her head was in a pot on the stove and some of her was in the fridge. He strangled her, dismembered her, and cooked her. Supposedly, he wasn't planning to eat her. He was trying to get rid of the evidence until his conscience caught up with him. The couple was Zach Bowen and Addie Hall, who had met in New Orleans and weathered Hurricane Katrina together and stayed in the area after the storm. If you Google them, you can find a picture that made it into some sort of magazine or newspaper that was a little fluff piece showing young lovebirds dealing with Katrina aftermath. 